So I try to do uh, double my money on a cash flip and triple my money on owner financing. So that's still where I'm at now, as far as your run of the mill regular deal. I mean, especially at the lower end, your percentages are huge. You know, roughly 300 to maybe a thousand percent returns. Welcome to the S Factor. My name is PJ Riley and I buy and sell vacant land, just dirt and trees. My success factor is that I'm consistent. I keep going, don't quit. And that's my advice to you. Hi, PJ. How are you today? Tarek, I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me on the podcast. Thank you so much for coming. I do appreciate that. Uh, you have a very fascinating story, especially <laughs> about uh, flipping land. And I'm sure you know a lot of people will find it very fascinating. But before that, uh, let's go back a little bit. You were born in the Barbados. You traveled around as a kid, a lot of it. So tell us about some of those early experiences. Yeah, yeah. So we were, I was born in Barbados. My dad was in the Navy. So we lived all over Europe, all over the United States and different cities and small towns all over the place. Um, landed in Denver. We landed right here. My dad had family here. Uh, so we ended up here in Colorado. Um, I got through high school and college. Uh, I was uh, in Colorado. I was on the dean's list in both high school and college. So I don't know if you know this, Tarek, but here in the United States, the dean has two lists. The dean has a list of people that are doing really good. You know, they're going to do the cum sum loud thing at graduation. They're going to wear all the gear. And then they have guys like me that are on a different list. And that list is, you know, they're going to ask you to leave school here soon uh, and not come back because your grades are really bad. But I did get out of high school and college with a 2.0 GPA. Um, so I graduated. I got out. Um, but I realized immediately that uh, my GPA was not going to get me, you know, any sort of big job or any, any any great career, you know, especially early on the actual, the jobs look for your GPA, right? They look at, see how you did in, in college. So I tried a ton of different entrepreneurial endeavors. You know, I tried insurance sales, um, personal training. Uh, I tried to, I, I was a professional fighter for a while. Um, that worked out to some degree. I didn't really make a lot of money at it, but it, it was, uh, it, it was pretty fun, I guess. Um, we tried this business where we were going to put credit card readers into police cars. So we're like, my buddy gets a speeding ticket. You know, he had a previous speeding ticket. Obviously, this guy needs to slow down a bit. He had a previous speeding ticket where he uh, he didn't pay it. They pull him over. They're like, hey, you're going to jail for the night because you didn't pay your last ticket. He's like, oh, great. So he goes to jail, comes out. And he's like, you know, we got to fix this. So, you know, an entrepreneur kind of thinks about things they can fix, right? So we're like, okay, we can, we got to figure out a way to make this easier. So we're like, credit card readers in police cars. Great idea. Bunch of banks thought it was great. They so they gave us uh, credit card readers. You know, we had all these. We have big banks too that that you would you would know the names of these companies if they uh, if I told them to you. Um, the downside was no police officer wants to or really should be running a credit card reader. So that was our roadblock. You know, the cities were like, no, we're not having our cops run. They're not going to be cashiers as well as police officers. They got enough on their plates. So that's kind of where it stopped. And uh, that's why we're not talking about my super cool credit card reader business right now. Mm -hmm. um, so I went to work one day. My buddy's like, uh, hey, you like real estate. Or you're, sorry, you're, you're an entrepreneur, right? Go buy land in Detroit. You, know, you can get it for $1. You can buy a house for a dollar. So I'm like, okay, cool. I go on YouTube, look up uh, how to buy a house for a dollar in Detroit. Turns out it's a lot more difficult than, um, than most people think and than I thought. Uh, you know, I, you probably could buy a house for, you know, maybe a dollar or a thousand dollars or something like that, but they're going to, by the time you get the, you know, your oven in there and your microwave, that thing's going to be gutted by the middle of the night. Uh, you know, it's not going to be there anymore. <clears throat> now, long story short or long during the course of my research on YouTube, I find this guy and he's talking about buying and selling vacant land. So I get about halfway through this guy's video. And I'm, I'm watching this video. I'm like, I could do this. I could buy and sell land. It's just dirt and trees, right? And I've always wanted to own land. So I thought it was really cool. So I go to Zillow, which is um, here in the United States. It's like a real estate site. You can buy houses and land and all that kind of stuff. And I find a guy. He's selling land. He's selling two properties, uh, $1,100 each for these small little squares about two hours south of me. So I'm like, well, I have about 1100 bucks saved up from a 
previous endeavor, right? And I'm going to... Now, I got halfway through this guy's video though. And he says, you've got to lowball the seller. You don't offer retail, you lowball them. So I go back to the guy on Zillow and I said, okay, I have 11... I, I, what if I buy both your properties for 1100 bucks, right? 550 each. Me thinking he's going to say, no way, this, it's not going to happen. Immediately, the guy was like, yes, absolutely. Let's do it. So I was like, oh, um, all right. Now what do we do from here? You know, I had no idea where to go from there. He's like, ah, don't sweat it, man. I'll get the deed turned into the, the, uh, the county. Just send me a check and we're good. So I send the guy a check. He gets everything recorded and I own both properties. Uh, you know, From there, I, I sold those things, I think, two weeks later for about, I want to say $1,500 each on Craigslist, which was, uh, I think you guys have a version in, in Canada of something like this, the same thing. Um, and, you know, I kind of started the, the machine rolling. I, I've obviously uh, progressed considerably. That was uh, seven and a half, almost eight years ago. And um, I progressed quite a bit and, you know, a little bit bigger properties, you know, have a little bit better system in place. You know, I have team, a team now that helps me out. Um, but yeah, that's, that kind of, that's kind of how things got started and that got us to the point we're at now. That's a really fascinating story. And uh, yes, uh, the version uh, you're talking about here in Canada is Kijiji. Okay. Uh, although we do have Craigslist here as well, but uh, not too many people actually use it. Uh, Kijiji is what is commonly used, I guess, uh, okay. for marketplace. But Facebook Marketplace is big uh, here. You know, that's their go-to, uh, most people's go-to uh, initially. So uh, very well said about progression, having a system in place, and we're going to touch on all those things. So in the last seven and a half, eight years, you've done about 500 deals already, mm -hmm. right? And you've already talked about your first deal. So what are some of these deals like? Like, for example, I know uh, just by talking to you is that most of these deals are not very high value deals. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, the vast majority, especially early on when I was doing this, um, they were very small deals. I say the average early on was around a thousand purchase price. So we're between a thousand and two thousand. I would purchase them for. You know, I've obviously changed quite a bit since then, but that's that was the the early on purchase price. I'd say for the first maybe three four years, really. Okay. Okay. Got it. So. People are very familiar with flipping houses. Like, you know, there is a TV network basically built around that. Yeah. Um, very few people are actually familiar with flipping land. So what is it about land which fascinates you? Yeah, honestly, um, it, it was just when I first did it, it was just I just started along this trajectory and started started doing it. I realized the the proof of concept almost immediately and I saw the returns. That was what was about that. That's what it was. It was the returns initially. I always liked land though too. I always wanted to own land somewhere and tell my friends I own land. Um, but it was the returns. I mean, it, especially at the lower end, your percentages are huge. You know, roughly 300 to maybe a thousand percent returns. Um, on these lower deals. Now, if you think about it, you're going to need a, quite a few of those to really accumulate to make a, a substantial amount of money. But if you're new to real estate, I mean, can you get in it? You can get it 500 bucks, you know, 500,000 bucks, somewhere around there and, you know, triple your money, uh, you know, start that ball rolling. So that's kind of why I, I chose land and stuck with it for so long. Got it. Uh, so, at the lower end, of course, the percentages are very high in terms of return. But overall, what would you say the percentages are like in terms of returns? Yeah. So overall, um, I'd say I'd say this: uh, I will double my money on a cash flip usually. So usually, I will you know if I buy for let's say ten thousand, I'll sell for twenty on a cash flip. Uh, if I sell for owner financing, which is what I, I do a lot, so I sell. So that, let's say our buyer, our end buyer, can't pay me the twenty thousand dollars cash, right? But they can do monthly payments. So let's do some monthly payments. Let's say three hundred, four hundred bucks a month. Property is yours. You know, I do bump up the the return a little bit. Let's say I sell it now for thirty thousand um, dollars, but at I don't know. 300, 400 bucks a month, they can afford that. And, and that's a uh, you know, way they can do it. So I try to do uh, double my money on a cash flip. 
and triple my money on owner financing. So that's still where I'm at now, as far as your run of the mill regular deal. Got it. Um, that's something which is very fascinating because the thing is that you are basically facilitating more sales and ease of actual purchase uh, for the buyers. Now, has there ever been a case where a buyer has stopped making monthly payments? Oh yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. And especially at the lower end. Mm. Um, you know, when I first started too, I would do, you know, a hundred bucks a month. I'd sell, I'd buy a property for a thousand, sell it for let's say three thousand or something. For, for example, then I'd sell it for a hundred bucks a month for 30 months, right? I'd say about 30% of those people would default. So about a third of every one of those would pay me a hundred bucks, 200 bucks, maybe 300 bucks, and then be like, you know what? I don't want it. And they're not out anything. It doesn't ding their credit. Um, you know, they paid a couple hundred bucks. Maybe they used it a couple of times and went out there and camped. Um, it's, it's always possible too. Uh, but early on, the default rate is really low. Now, if you want to eliminate that default rate, uh, you know, go in, you're going to have to do higher dollar properties and have a down payment. Let's say I sell a property for uh, $30,000 with a $5,000 down payment, right? Well, now the buyer is, is invested in it a little bit more. They got skin in the game. So they're less likely to default at that higher range. Honestly, almost nobody defaults for me anything above, let's say $30,000. Almost nobody defaults. Uh, now below that, at the, that 100, 200 bucks a month range, it was about 30% would default uh, on their payments. Okay. And what happens in case of default? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I want these guys to get their land. You know, I really mm -hmm. want them to have the property because we'd had, we built a rapport. You know, they said they wanted this land. They wanted to build a, pro have a property they could send their grandkids to, you know, down the road. Um, but a lot of times they just ghost you. They just stop responding. You can email them, call them. Hey, what's going on? You know, I mean, is anything going on in your life right now that, that's um, causing you to not be able to make this payment? Because, you know, some things happen for people and even a hundred bucks a month can be significant if you're in certain situations. So uh, I'm like, hey, you know, do you need a couple months off? Do you need, what if we dropped it to 50 bucks a month? You know, um, but the vast majority of time, I'd say 90% of the time, they just stop responding. They ghost you, they won't respond and they go away. And then I just resell the property. Got it. So you've talked a little bit about the motivation for these buyers, right? How about the sellers? Do you get into that level when you're buying a property? Like why it is that they're selling it off? Yeah, a lot of times, you know, these guys will say, okay, I bought this property 20 years ago. My wife and I were going to build our dream home on this property. We were going to go out there, hunt, camp. Uh, there's a lake, you know, four miles down the road. We were going to go fish that lake every day, come back to the RV, you know, camp, have a good time with the kids. And they just never did. They just simply never did. They never went to the property. They never did the things that they uh, planned on doing. Life got in the way for whatever reason. Right. And sometimes you have maybe, let's say, somebody buys a property in Nevada. They live in New York. Right. They have, they, they had this idea they were going to go out to Nevada, start a new life, build this property up, and they just never did. Um, that's almost everybody that tries to sell me their properties. Um, sometimes I will get a, you know, grandma gave me a property. She gave it to me. Now I got to pay taxes on this thing. I have, I live in Florida. The property's in Colorado. You know, I'm never going to go out there. So can you take it off my hands? And a lot of times I'll jump in and, and have to fix that situation and, and I'll buy that from them too. Got it. Got it. Okay, perfect. So now we are going to be talking about, uh, which is actually one of my favorite topics, is about the system that you have in place. Mm -hmm. Because I know we've talked about it. It's, um, it's highly automated. And I think that uh, people, uh, the listeners, will find it very fascinating how you've gone about creating this system, which I think is perfect for anyone who's trying to run a similar kind of business. So yeah. uh, give us some insight about your system. Yeah, so it's pretty much a machine. I, I mean, I, I try to get as hands off as I can, especially at the, the beginning. So what I will do is um, I will come, I will find out what area I wanna buy land in, right? Whatever it is, I will pull a list from a data source. So this is the only part I have in this initially. I'll pull a list from a data source, 
um, I use data tree. So uh, let's say I want to buy four to six acre properties in, uh, let's say I'm in Adams County. Let's say Adams County, Colorado. I want to buy four to six acre properties in Adams County, Colorado. I'll pull that list from the data source. Then I'll send it to the VA. VA scrubs the list, gets rid of any sort of uh, errors in there. Maybe something doesn't have an address. Uh, one of the properties, the, P- the APN is messed up. They'll get rid of all that stuff. They will send that cleaned up list to my letter printing company. So the letter printing company, uh, they they build letters. Basically, they mail merge letters and envelopes for me in the criteria that I have pre-chosen, right? So I, I like handwritten fonts on the letters. Um, the letter company will then send those letters out for me. Um, so, so far, all I've done right there is pull a list. I've literally typed in, I want four to six acres in Adams County, Colorado. Boom, enter, email it off. I don't do anything after that. So at this point, letters are out there. The letters get to potential sellers, right? All these property owners are getting letters. I sent out about 10,000 a month. So I sent out a lot of letters. Um, they get those, they respond. There's tons of ways to respond to my letters. So there's um, email, website, phone calls. They can get me however they want. Um, so a lot of times they'll call back and I have a voice answering or a, an answering service. The answering service, I use a company called Pat Live. They will ask a specific amount of questions. You know, hey, what county is this property in? What's the parcel number? Uh, you know, do you have any questions or anything like that? Um, they'll ask a bunch of questions. They will email me that list. So that that automated that that response. So they'll email all of the information to me. That way I can look through and say, this guy dropped a bunch of F bombs on my answering service. I'm not calling him back, right? This guy says, yeah, maybe let's talk about it. You know, this lady says, I want to renegotiate. So at least I'll have information so that I can jump in, call these people back or email them back however they wanted to uh, to talk and and get a conversation going there. Uh, now let's say one of those five people is ready to sell me the property. Uh, I, I, I say, okay, let's, 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 uh, get a, get a deal going here. Um, I will send a mobile notary to their address to sign the paperwork. So the mobile notary gets the, the deed, all, any additional paperwork that needs to be signed, sent to them. They go to the customer. They give the customer their cashier's check, sign the paperwork, notarize everything, and then send it off to the county. The county records the deed and then sends me the recorded deed. Okay. At that point, I own the property. You know, it's all mine. Um, now I got to figure out how to sell this thing. I have um, pre formatted ads, pictures, information on these properties. So I just put the parcel number in there. My VA on the sell side goes in there and posts a bunch of ads on Facebook Marketplace and we sell the property. That's awesome. <laughs> it really is. It's um, You have delegated everything in such a manner that things just move on their own, right? Yeah. You're just overseeing the entire process and all that kind of stuff. So that's really, really good, man. Um, one more thing. One yeah. more thing, though, on the sell side. Mm-hmm. Uh, some of the properties are of a higher value. Yeah. Right? They're, they're, they're more expensive, mm-hmm. bigger deals. I will not have the VA. I will have the VA post those ads. They can mm-hmm. post them, but I'll also have. Uh, I'll, I will try my best to put them out with a realtor that mm-hmm. works specifically with land. So okay. I'll say, "Hey, here's my information on this property. I'll shoot it over to them. Take care of it. Okay. They'll take care of everything. They will mm-hmm. have a title company do all the work. Mm-hmm. I would literally do nothing at that point. Okay. That, at that point, I am completely out of it. I'll sign some paperwork and I'll sell the property that way too." Awesome. And approximately, what's the range of uh, percentage are you paying to the realtor? Uh, it varies. You know, mm-hmm. usually it's higher because they're they're not. I'm not selling you know a million dollar houses out here. Mm-hmm. So I would say around ten at least ten percent. Okay. Um, but if you're looking at it, well, let's say let's say six to ten percent. How about that? Six to ten percent. Uh, okay. Because you're looking at much smaller deals. So if they want to put their time and effort into this mm-hmm. uh, to make a smaller return, you got to bump up the percentage just a little bit. Of course, of course, got it. And you seldom visit these properties, correct? Mm-hmm. Yeah, almost never. Almost. I almost never go to properties. I did go to one mm-hmm. a month or two ago, I think. Mm-hmm. And but other than that, man, I almost never go. I mean, I live in Denver and half of the properties are out of state. Mm-hmm. So 
you know, I work in 10 to 15 different states at any given time. Okay. So it all, I can't be in every place at, at every time. Now I will say that's good on the, the buy side, right? Mm-hmm. I don't need to go out there. I can send people out there if I want. On the sell side, it gets kind of iffy sometimes. People want to find out who the actual owner is. They want to, in a lot of rural areas, they want to meet me at the property. I'm like, I don't meet anybody at the property, man. That's that's you know, three hour flight, and I'm not gonna I'm not gonna go out there on the off chance that I can sell something. All right, got it. So speaking of areas, which particular areas are you focused on? I know you mentioned that you're in multiple different states, mm-hmm. right? But yeah. tell us about the areas which really piques your interest, right? So if if I were you looking at a particular parcel of land. You know, just walk me through like what is your process of looking at that? Now, now, what area when I go searching for land or yeah, or searching for land. currently buying? Okay, okay. For. yeah. So I want it to be aesthetic. You know, I want it to be a place that I would want to own land too, right? So I pref- and, and this is just personal preference, and it just seems to be guiding my business so far. I like trees. I like road access. Got to have road access. Um, I prefer trees. If there's not, that's fine too. There has to be something drawing me to that property. So maybe a big lake. You know, if you're in Arizona, there's a great big lake nearby, like uh, what's it, Havasu or you know, any of these big lakes down there. Um, that would be a drawing, something to draw me to that that property too. So anything that would really, uh, anything aesthetic, I guess. Big lakes, mountains, trees. I like it to have road access though. That's probably number one. I want to be able to drive up, pull my truck right up onto the property and look at it. That has to be number one. Outside of that, um, yeah, it's just anything aesthetic, anything that would draw a um, a large pool of buyers to the property itself. All right. And what about uh, the particular areas that you're invested in currently? Yeah. So right now, I stick to, um, I like Colorado, Wyoming. You know, I like this area. Um, I like Oklahoma a lot. Um, that middle America, uh, it's very green. There's a lot of land there. Um, and those guys like their land, you know, anything from Texas into Oklahoma, Arkansas, that whole area. Um, they love land. It's a, it's a social, it's a status thing, you know? So whereas, you know, you're in Vancouver, if a guy pulls up to your, let's say you're out having dinner with the family, right? Guy pulls up in a Ferrari. Everybody's like, Whoa, a Ferrari. Now that guy's really making it. That's, that's impressive. If you pulled up in that same Ferrari in Oklahoma in a you know small town at the local Elks Club, you know they probably kick your ass. <laughs> they don't. It's not a status symbol. However, if you were that same guy, pull up in your truck and talk about the eighty acres you own in you know that part of town that everybody likes that that part of the you know the rural area that everybody likes to go hunting and fishing. That's a that's the status symbol for for that part of the world, right? So um, it's just a status thing. Uh, for for that type of area, and that's I I like it too. So that's kind of what draws me to those those middle America type areas. I'm actually in Toronto. <laughs> Toronto, just, yeah. What's I, with the, the shirt that you're tricking? Yeah, me? I, I I got the Vancouver shirt on, man. But uh, uh, Toronto would be the same thing. I think a Ferrari yeah. in Toronto. Toronto, I don't know though. Toronto, a Ferrari might be like the average car. Uh, no, it's a pretty not high the average place car, no. No, it, no, the average car familiar. is probably a Civic or a okay. Corolla or something. But okay. um, yeah, you're right. Um, in certain areas, obviously downtown, mm-hmm. you will see a lot of luxury cars. Yeah. You know, that's just the way it is, right? But I do understand your point. Uh, okay, perfect. Now this leads me to one of the final things I wanted to know from you: is that yeah. where do you see the future, uh, uh, or how do you see the future in this business? Yeah. So where I'm at now, um, obviously I'm progressing into a different part of that land business. What I did before was great for entry level people, right? When you're new to the land business, it's really great to go in, have an option to pay a thousand bucks, get five acres and, you know, start your journey that way. Um, for the future of my business, it's more subdividing properties. Um, you know, buying a little bit larger acreage, maybe, and and putting in some roads maybe or or something like that. It's it's um it's a larger play. It's not as fast, so I'm not going to get 500 more deals right where I'm subdividing uh, 40 acres in a in an urban area. Um, but the the returns are significantly higher. 
Uh, but the that's kind of where I'm moving. That's the direction I'm moving right now. A little bit more subdividing, slowing down the uh, the the amount of lower priced properties, uh, and kind of moving into a little bit bigger properties with a little bit more things involved. I'm not just able to flip the property to a guy on Facebook Marketplace. Maybe I find a builder who is you know they're looking to put houses somewhere. Well, hey, I got 40 acres subdivided, ready to go. You know. Go for it. That's you know I have a property there, so that's kind of where I'm going. Future of the industry is just like anything else, man. Um, you know you're going to have certain times of the uh, certain seasons where everybody jumps in, like crypto, like um, drop shipping, all these things you see on on YouTube, right? You're going to have uh, certain seasons where maybe a new a coach comes out and says, "Hey, you can have a Ferrari if you buy and sell land." So you're going to have a ton of people run up and and, and ramp up in the business. But it's just like anything else. Uh, after a while, it slows down and it comes back up, slows back down. Um, the barrier to entry is really good. So you're going to have a lot more people, I think, inland, especially coming uh, into the near future. All right. Excellent. Uh, PJ, if people wanted to find you, where would they look? Dude, I am everywhere. YouTube uh, on Land Life, L A N D L I F E. Mm -hmm. uh, Facebook, PJ Riley. Uh, mm -hmm. Instagram is at PJ Riley22, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, TikTok, I'm on TikTok. I'm too old nice. to be on TikTok, but I'm there nice. anyway. Uh, PJ Riley is yeah. Land Life on uh -huh. TikTok. Okay. Instagram, sorry, I did Instagram. LinkedIn, PJ mm -hmm. Riley. Mm -hmm. I was pretty much just look my name up and uh, you'll find me. Awesome. And we are going to link all those things in the description below. Awesome. So definitely check it out. Uh, PJ, thank you so much uh, for your time today. I do appreciate that. And I wish you all the best for your next 500. Thank you so much, Tarek. I, I, I had a great time, man.